Good morning and thank you everyone for joining us today. Today we are going to be talking about knowledge is power. My name is Eliana Tardillo and I'm the program director for the Parent Education Network. Today we are very pleased and happy to have Donna Jer from the school district, Lee County School District with us. Before letting her introduce herself, I'm going to talk a little about the FND and the Parent Education Network. We are a family-driven organization. It means that everyone who works in FND, we have children with special needs or there are people with special needs on their own, so they understand the system and they understand what you are going through. We are a non-for-profit organization funded by the Department of Education, and we serve uh, people with special needs from 0 to 26 years old and their families. We provide support, information, and we help families identify their options, but we are not attorneys. So welcome, Donna. I'm very excited, and this is a great collaboration. Thank you so much for doing this with us. Thank you so much, Juliana, for agreeing to collaborate with me. Um, I want to thank any of you that are tuning in to this webinar today. I'm hoping that uh, we're all bearing down and surviving our Hurricane Matthew. It's sometimes uh, a good time to reflect and ponder on what's truly important in our lives. Uh, funny, when Mother Nature is at play, it kind of humbly puts us back into perspective. Uh, so we, Eliana and I, are so blessed to be working together, and we look forward to doing future webinars together also. So we're interested in the feedback. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you, everyone. And as you can see on your screen, you're going to see a chat box. That's the place where you can actually put your comments, and we are going to be able to reply to you. Or you can actually raise your hand, and I'm going to be able to open and so you can participate of this webinar. So we are going to start defining IDA. IDA is the Individuals with Disabilities Education Improvement Act, and your child with a special needs receives education under IDEA. IDEA has four parts. Part A, that are the general provisions. This is the information that let, let us know how to provide the services. Part B is public school from, from 3 to 22 years old. Part C is the early intervention process from 0 to 3 years old for those kids who are diagnosed with a special needs when they are born or when they are babies or toddlers. And Part D are the national activities. All right, one thing that's exciting about being uh, an employee of the school district is we are able to serve children that possibly could be eligible from the ages of 3 to 21. Uh, I love what we do because we need to ensure that there is indeed that individualized portion of our child's education. Um, if a child requires special education and related services, you would be, have to come familiar with an IEP, the IEP being the Individualized Education Plan. As we go through this presentation together, we will be touching upon key issues such as the least restrictive environment and really trying to drive home how very important parental involvement is. Um, parenting in general is probably one of the most challenging jobs for many of us. Uh, parent involvement when we have children who have unique or different challenges really puts a responsibility on us that we must become experts in all of our children with and without children with disabilities. Exactly. Um, I think that that is especially, you know, the most important part that we want you to understand and take from this presentation. You are your child's best advocate. No one can do your job. Donna is amazing and is always there to help families and also here available to help families. But even trying to become the best advocate for, our, for your child, we cannot do your job. So we are going to be always here to provide information and help you with everything that we can do for you. But we want you to empower you to become that advocate so you can really be sure that your child is receiving the right services. And you can help people have high expectations about your child with special needs or disabilities. There truly is about six principles of the IDEA law. FAPE refers to a free and appropriate public education. 
What I like about that is your child is indeed entitled to a free and appropriate public education. Um, we have many laws in place to secure our child's civil rights and liberties. So there's an evaluation process that has to be adhered to in order to see if your child is indeed eligible for special services. The IEP is principal. It is the, it's a lot of information. So again, we're going to be committed to providing ongoing training. Parent and student participation. If you really think it through, it, the, we wouldn't have this process if it wasn't for the students, and the students belong to the parents. For you folks, your participation, it's all about you. Uh, the least restrictive environment, you need to understand the hierarchy of services. There's a total continuum of services. And every time you're ever invited to a meeting, you're going to be given so many copies of your procedural safeguards that some people will joke I could line my cabinets with them. Instead of lining our cabinets, I would really encourage you to read them because it can be a very intimidating process to come to a table with several other professionals around the table. You must be aware of your procedural safeguards and it may ease your fear because ultimately this is your child that we're speaking of. Exactly. And something that I want to add about that is that me being the parent of two children with significant disabilities, the mother of two children with Down syndrome in the school system, I can really tell that all this information can make a great difference in your child's life. Because if you don't understand this, it's going to be really hard to advocate for your child when you really understand the law and when you really understand that your child has this right to have free appropriate public education and you can go through the evaluations and really understand where he is in terms of uh, performance and you can be part of the goals that you are going to create in the IEP and bring that voice and that information about your child, you're going to be doing a great, great job and that's what you have to do. So something else about this part is that you are going to listen many times the acronyms about these uh, terms in the IEP meetings and when your child is starting to receive special education, so you need to get used to this. IEP, Individualized Education Plan, FAPE, Free Appropriate Public Education, LRE, Least Restrictive Environment, so uh, yes, so you, you, are, you are sure that you understand because many times you're going to hear these acronyms and please ask what do you mean because that's important so you can really be part of all the decisions and all the information that is shared on the IEP table. When we go to look at the special education process, I'd be lying if I didn't tell you that it can be a lengthy process. There has to be a referral process and then there's an evaluation um, and then there's an eligibility hearing or staffing. Then the IEP is written, placement is discussed, tracking and reporting, and reevaluation. This is a lot of content. I might think of working with a system or a bureaucracy if you're buying a home. If you're, anytime you're unfamiliar with the language that's being used, it truly is in your best interest to educate yourself on that educational jargon and to never, ever hesitate to say, what are you talking about? We now have like the MTSS process, the multi-tier system of, of support. That's all part of that early referral process. Um, we'll, we'll touch upon this more as we go. When it comes to the referral process, truly, Anyone can initiate a referral. Um, if you feel that your child is experiencing challenges or difficulties, um, you can put in writing that you are requesting uh, your child to be evaluated. It's usually, I feel it's always best if you work in a collaborative spirit. So you're hearing from your teacher, you're working together, you are identifying strategies to help our children experience success at school. I'm a parent and I'm also an educator. The two environments are truly very different. There are certain expectations and um, 
in the public school setting, you have to almost learn how to be one of a group. You have to you learn school language and school behavior, where we go to the bathroom, where we go to centers. Those aren't how our houses are usually set up. So there has to be a bridge that's built between home and school so that your focus is always on the child who is the most important person in this process. Anyone can start the referral process. You need to identify skills, strategies, pre-referral activities, and no one can evaluate your child without your consent or your permission. So you always need to know that it's not what we do to you, we need to be working with you and together. So before any kind of change or anything can happen, we need your consent to evaluate your child. It's a, it should be a fluid process. It shouldn't be one size fits all. And we should always be trying to come up with strategies to ensure that our children are experiencing school success. And that may look different for all of our children Working in exceptional student education, the spectrum of where our children fall is so vast that sometimes I get hesitant to speak to a whole group because there's such a unique attributes to each of our children that one universal response or one universal training um, is, it makes me uneasy sometimes because there's such diversity in our children. So it brings it back full circle. Please help become an expert in your child because then we can take our vast knowledge with your expertise and the sky's the limit for making those strategies in place for your child to be successful. I think two important points to bring to your attention at this point is that many times families, they get scared about referring their children. Many times they identify that their children may have a disability or special needs when their kids are very young, but they are scared about the labels. Something else is that it happens too that when they start school that they may feel like scared about talking about their children's special needs. I just want to remind you that everyone is here to help and when your child is actually <laughs> identified and your child goes through the evaluation process as Donna was saying, you are going to be an important part of the team. You are part of the team. Or you are going to bring important information that is going to make everything easier for everyone. So don't be scared about the evaluation process. Don't forget that the, as soon as your child is identified, we are going to be able to provide more services. It's going to be easier for him. And everything is about helping your child to be successful. And everything is about your child not the disability, but the child. This is about the individual, so that's something very important to keep in mind. Okay, we're going to talk very briefly about the evaluation process. We must have parental consent. It must be written consent in order for an evaluation to occur. When we identify that we feel that we need to do a specific evaluation, with psychoeducational testing, we have to specify on that paper you'll be signing what evaluations it is that we're looking for. If we think that a child may be um, having academic difficulty, a child may have social emotional difficulty, they may have communication difficulty, um, all of that needs to be identified in that written request so you what type of evaluation will be taking place, then the results will be shared with you and you will be invited to come to a table to determine if your child actually meets eligibility criteria. Um, there, one part of, uh, that I think as a parent and an educator is um, there are specific disability categories. Um, we don't, like some folks will say, well, what about dyslexia? Um, or what about, there's so many DSM diagnoses. But in terms of the federal IDEA category and then translated to the Florida ESD category, they are very specific labels or categories, exceptionality. 
These are utilized strictly to determine eligibility. Your child's services and support are based on your child's needs, not necessarily based on their category. Again, the categories are established to determine eligibility. So we heard of autism spectrum disorder, deaf or hard of hearing, developmentally delayed, refers to pre-kindergarten only. By the time your child turns six years old, DD or developmentally delayed is no longer an unacceptable category. It would have to be found in one of the other identified dual sensory impaired, emotional or behavioral difficulties, gifted, homebound or hospitalized, um, mentally handicapped, uh, we now say intellectual disabilities, physically impaired with orthopedic impairment, physically impaired with other health impairment, that's a very broad exceptionality, uh, physically impaired with traumatic brain injury, a specific learning disability, that's kind of a global term that will catch some of that dysgraphia, dyslexia, those umbrella terms for having difficulty learning to read or write or do mathematics, speech and language impaired or visually impaired. Um, I really would encourage you when you are looking at your child's IEP that you familiarize yourself with what category was your child identified as being eligible for. We do live in a day of technology. Here we are in a webinar. You can go on so many important sites that are specific to that exceptionality to help educate yourself. And I want to reiterate, Ileana and I are blessed to have our jobs being out there to help you. So know that you are, we are available to you to assist in any of this acquisition process of being a child, of, uh, an expert on your child, knowing that knowledge is indeed power. Exactly. And something else here is that many times you aren't going to hear ASD, that is autism spectrum disorder. You're going to listen people saying like DD or the most common SLD, and these again are acronyms about, you know, these categories. So, yes, so you are aware of that. It may happen. And I always remind families, ask, ask, ask when you don't understand because it is super important that you can actually understand everything that people is discussing so you can be an active part of the group and the decisions. Okay, the individualized education plan, there's specific components of the IEP. One of the primary components is parent participation. You can expect that every time you are getting ready, and we should be giving you at least 10 day notice prior to being invited to your child's IEP, they're always, every year, going to ask you, <clears throat> what are your parents' desires for your student's outcome? Please put thought into that prior to going to the meeting. What are your expectations? What are your long-term goals? Where are your concerns coming from? It might be as simple as, I want my child to experience success in reading. Or your parent concern may be far more extended. I'm concerned with their social emotional growth. I want to make sure they have friends. I want to make sure that they're being successful. There's, it's not a short answer response. It's an open-ended response, but please think in advance. What are your concerns about your child's educational outcome? Um, the present level of performance, I'm going to say it again present levels of performance. That's referred to in the land of acronyms, what's your PLEP, your PLEP. That's telling me, where is your child currently performing? What are the things that they can do? Um, it's important that the PLEP, in my opinion, be stated in positive terms. I don't really want to know everything your child can't do. I want to know what your child can do. And I want accurate current levels of where they're functioning in those five domain areas. Um, the five domain, if you crisscross the slide, there's five domains that we primarily look at in the educational realm. And that is in the area of curriculum and learning. Where is the child performing academically? 
also social emotional. We may we don't necessarily do all five domains for every child. We could hone in on which goal which domains are going to require specific goals. It could be independent functioning, um, social emotional, other health care parts, or communication. So as a team, when you come together, they will tell you, you will talk about what domains are going to be targeted. And then after we identify those present levels of performance is where we then identify annual goals that will be targeted. Um, that will also lead to what special instruction is required and are there related services such as OT, speech and language, there could be so many variances on the latest services. I love this picture that you can see here because actually it is completely true. When you sit on the IEP table, actually everyone has a piece and everyone's piece is important to complete the puzzle and be able to provide that child the best services and the free appropriate public education that our children deserve and have right to receive. So when we talk about parent participation, Think about the IEP as the most important time for you as a parent to come to the table and bring information that maybe the team doesn't have or they don't have because they see your child as a student and they don't know your child as an individual many times. And many times your child can be doing so much more at home. Many times your child has a different personality at home. You are doing things with your child and all this information that you're going to be able to provide is going to actually provide a lot, a lot of help to everyone to understand what are, what are the needs of your child. Something else, don't take this like another meeting, something that you have to do in a half hour or an hour to get rid of this responsibility. This is very important. Talk uh, with your family about your child goals. These annual goals, they represent, you know, all your dreams for your child. And eventually, you're going to start talking with your child and discussing with your child because these are going to be goals that you're going to be setting with your child. So it's important to always remind families how important they are and how important it is for them to come to the table with great ideas, with experience, with feelings, with dreams. You have to dream high, and the IEP is about dreaming high and having high expectations about your child because with those expectations, you are going to set expectations for everyone else. Ileana, I like how you brought us back to the picture here because true collaboration really it, it symbolically should be in a reciprocal circular table. If you know you're at a good meeting when you're not just slicing and dicing your child, but everybody is invested. And what's really cool is if you have the PE coach. He may came up with a strategy for communication, or the speech and language therapist may be able to help you with a written language goal. It's truly everybody has their perspective, but true collaboration is when you let that spirit rise and you just work together for the betterment of the child. Okay. Are you going to read? Yeah, we have a question from Elizabeth. I have a question. My son will be transitioning next year from Head Start to Kindergarten. Will it be possible to go to an inclusive kindergarten class? My main concern is that because mine has physical disabilities motor-wise, usually people tend to recommend life skills classes. And honestly, this year he has done wonderfully with regular peers from counting, color, shapes, and letters. He struggles with writing, but we still need to find ways to get him to write. Thank you so much for your question, Elizabeth. Working together with your IEP team is totally going to be critical. Um, to make a blatant statement or, well, no, if you have physical limitations, you go to a classroom with children with no. Your child's needs and together, especially where he's having a successful year, that's what's going to be decided at what we call a riser meeting. And when I say that's what's going to be decided, you're part of that decision-making process. So it's really difficult for Ileana or I to say yes, no. It's working with that team. 
and making under your parent concern. The question that you wrote, if we turned it around into a declarative, is a perfect uh, example of what are your parents' concerns for your child's education? Restate the question that you just gave. And that puts everybody kind of on notice where this is what's important to this family. Now we move forward. We talk about the present level of educational performance. We talk about the supports and services. And we need to remember that support ESC, Exceptional Student Education, refers to a level of support, not a place. And we really need to get past that. When we look at any time writing um, that free and appropriate public education, we always should begin with the child's graded in general education. And it's not until those goals are identified that we start backing out those supports for what level of intensity of instruction is needed. There really is a hierarchy of skills. So we really kind of come to the table where everyone is in a general ed setting. And then we start based on that flat and the goals and objectives determining how are we going to deliver those supports. It's a level of support, not a place. Exactly. And something important too, because I have the experience with my children, including my children, is that we have to do our jobs as parents at home. We have to create inclusive opportunities in the community. We have to start the job, you know, by ourselves. So when they start school, they are going to have the skills and they are going to be ready, you know, to take full advantage of school too, you know, I think that's important information that we can bring to the table too. This is my child's life. This is my child's natural environment. He has been always included. This is what we do in the community. So when you show that you are involved, when you really participate as a parent, that's a big thing too that is going to really help to uh, decide the, base, the best placement for your child. Okay, the components, we kind of talked a little bit about this, but that least restrictive environment. And, you know, when I told you when we talked to the masses, sometimes the least restrictive environment for one child looks very different than another child. Um, so that's very individualized in the terminology, in the spirit of the law. Accommodations and modifications are huge. And Ileana and I will be doing future webinars just on that topic. Mm -hmm. The accommodations refer to I'm keeping my grade level expectations the same, but how I deliver the instruction or require the assessment, I can accommodate you. I can provide that in a differentiated instructional model so that you don't have to um, perform all the same way. In our district, we're kind of looking more towards that universal design of learning. A modification is when I take what the typical grade level standard is and I'm going to change it. So I'm going to modify the grade level expectation. Sometimes I've heard people use the word accommodation and modification interchangeably. They are very two different words with different meanings. Uh, dates and places, that's key on knowing uh, the services and where those supports and services will take place. Transition service needs, that's when our children are reaching that age of 14 and 16 and now we're trying to build a bridge to post-school outcomes. And the age of maturity is a reporting method of <coughs> when our children are reaching the age of 18, we need to kind of provide you with that notice a year before to let you know, to remind and gently remind us mamas that our children are going to be adults and they will be the age of majority. There's a lot of, depending on our children, a lot of different components that come along with that. Um, as a district, we usually do um, at least one or two uh, workshops on roles, trust, guardianship, some of those things that may be of an issue for, for some of our kids. Um, again, because these are so, this is so much information, there is no way we can go through all these at uh, this presentation. So we are going to be breaking all this information in another uh, presentation. And we hope that we are going to have your input about this so we can plan for the future workshops and we can expand on transition and accommodations and modifications.
great. I did love that past t-shirt. I am the eye in the eye in the face. I can't believe I'm making it go back to the graphic. <laughs> All right. Participation. Parent participation. The opportunities are endless. You need to get involved in your child's education. You need to know the school processes. I mean, I would almost challenge folks to look on even the website. Every different school has a different flavor, a different flair, a different taste. What Ileana may find appealing may be very unappealing to me. Um, what I may like is very different than what she's looking for. But every school, there is definitely district procedures and policy. But every school kind of has a little twist and flavor of its own. It's important that you be aware of those hidden curriculum and know how to navigate your specific school. Many teachers have different ways that they like to communicate. The same as parents. I don't really care about what your communication preference is as long as there is one. We need a process for communication. It always bothers me, Ileana, when I go to an IEP meeting and I'm finding out at an IEP meeting, you mean my child's not eating lunch? That should be something that's communicated. If your child is on medication and has dietary restrictions, you should not be meeting once a year. You know the IEP is conducted at least once a year. Communication, especially for a lot of our children, we need something much more frequent than that. And you need to know how to access information. A lot of our schools now, we have Chromebooks with the Google Chrome at the middle and high school level. Um, even though it may be a different vocabulary, the schools will hold functions and Eliana and I can help you get connected. How do I know how to access the Google Chrome class? If your child is using that as a system, in my opinion is you need to know what system they're using so that you can be a collaborative partner. Um, that was just one example of access to information. Also, IEP meeting information. Uh, I told you we're committed to doing a course just on how to prepare for your IEP meeting. So these are some levels of parent participation that are really important. And many times it's hard, you know, to create this bonding with the school because everyone is busy, the teachers are busy, yeah. you are busy, everyone is busy. For, but let's keep in mind that the more connected you are to your child's teachers and your child at school, the, the less stress you're going to feel because when our children have sometimes significant disabilities and they are not fully verbal, you depend on the teachers. You want to know what is happening. And that's why it's so important that if you feel that things are not working, try again and try again and try again because this is about your child and the teacher has like 20 children or 30 children so she's busy. So come to the teacher and ask her what will be the best way to communicate with you. Uh, how do you feel we can make this work? I understand that you are busy, but I want you to understand that if you don't send me that picture, I'm never going to be able to know what is happening. If you don't work with me, I have no way to know what is happening with my child, and I want to be an active participant of this process. Many times it's all about you know saying those words so everything changes, so let's keep in mind that it is our responsibility as parents to keep trying and to make things happen. It is a team, it is collaboration, but again, this is for uh, our children, so we have to do our job. Eliana, thanks so much for talking about recognizing how busy we all become. And don't forget, middle and high school, those teachers are seeing over 200 children a day. So it's very, they see a lot of different kids. So coming up with an effective way of communicating is really critical. Um, the other thing, too, and this is the fact that I am an educator, please don't ever forget to thank our teachers when we're really happy and we're really appreciative. I always considered my children's teachers for the year our newest family member. It means that we're going to talk about you at our dinner table, and we're going to be told that I'm not doing things like Mrs. Smith is doing, and all of that. They become like another family person. Please remember to just say thank you as well, because... Um, Frequently, they don't hear that. Exactly. We only talk to them when something when is a burden. <laughs> yes, something's so, on fire. Yeah. All right. 
displacement and least restrictive environment. We've touched upon that a few times. I've used words like continuum of services. I've used words like least restrictive environment. I've used words like um, a hierarchy. Um, if we were to look at the continuum of services, general education, fully included, would be where most of our children fall in general. There's a fully included general ed classroom. We then, if we move down the continuum, there's a few other service deliveries that are not stated here, such as facilitated support or consultative. Some children don't need direct instruction, but maybe they need the uh, support of an expert in helping identify the accommodation. So there, there could be just support facilitation, consultation. There could be pull-out part-time or push-in services. We're seeing more and more of the inclusion model in today's day and age where folks are pushing in those supports. You may have a a general ed teacher working side by side with a specially trained ESD teacher. So it's that part-time or full-time. Uh, we still have ESD classes that could be um, an all-day separate class within a general school, within a public school, but maybe the child spends more time in a special class. Again, we want to always be looking for inclusive opportunities for all of our children. Uh, we do still have a couple of ESD center schools. We actually only have like I think two left. Uh, we have uh, Buckingham Center and we have Royal Palm Exceptional Center. That just means that the school is primarily built to have an IEP. Again, always continuing to look for um, Buckingham now has two schools, one home. They've uh, partnered up with Riverdale High School to offer some of those more um, inclusive opportunities. We have children in our district who receive their educational instruction at home through hospital homebound. We have children who spend time in hospitals receiving supports and services. Uh, sometimes when I get up and will complain, sometimes we need to count our blessings because we do serve children who may be very, very ill. Um, and then there are a very small percentage of kids who may be attending a residential school. So they are living and learning away from their home. That pretty much articulates the entire continuum of services. Something else that is really important for families is you need to be aware about everything that is happening with your child. You are going to define what kind of reporting you are going to get to understand how is the progress of your child. It's important that you know that you have the right to ask questions. You need to know everything that is happening. So never be scared or never feel that someone is going to get mad with you if you ask so many questions because actually this is the best way to understand the information and to be an active and effective participant. So we always empower families to ask who is providing the service, what kind of services are you providing, when are the services happening, how are they delivered, where they happen, why they happen. So feel free to ask these questions always because everyone that is working with your child and everyone who wants to do a good job is going to be happy to answer these questions because once you know what is happening and you feel confident about everything that is happening at the school, you're going to feel relieved and you're going to feel part of the progress and you're going to come to the teacher and ask her, I know that he's receiving these services, I don't know why things are not getting better with him, we need to review this goal, this is what we are doing at home, so this is again part of what collaboration means. When it comes to evaluations and re-evaluations, um, you have an annual review, part of your IEP. Um, your child must be re-evaluated a minimum of three years. Now when I say that, it could uh, the semantics here could be involved. Uh, frequently, we don't necessarily provide a formal, complete psychoeducational evaluation every three years. Sometimes we may uh, see an informal evaluation. All of that will be discussed at the child's IEP, but they must be re-evaluated at least every three years. 
mean, ultimately, a child may be found eligible for services and then eventually not be eligible for services. So it's it's a built-in kind of civil rights <coughs> and liberties protection so that children are constantly that ebb and flow of our specialized instruction still needed. You will always be asked again for your consent. You will know that, uh, again, this is not something we do to you as a district. We do this together. So being aware of the annual review, three-year re-eval, uh, but consent, reviewing that information. And um, if you, we ever provide an evaluation and you just so disagree with it, you think they've missed the mark, they don't understand your child, there could be a multitude of reasons. If you go back to those procedural safeguards, you as a parent have a right to an independent educational evaluation or at least to ask for one. The district will then be communicating with you. Um, if they deny that, they have to put it in writing why they are denying it. But again, this is something that we need to be doing together. But an IEE, an independent educational evaluation, is part of your procedural safeguards. Um, part, speaking of procedural <laughs> safeguards, da -da 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 -da. Um, your participation is key. You also have the right to review records. You know, in the school lingo, we call this your cumulative records. We call it a team folder. In the team folder, it would have everything from your enrollment paperwork, if there's custody issues. In the green portion of that Manila team folder, is the ESC record and reporting. It would have any psychological testing. It will have a copy of all of your child's IEPs. You as a parent have a right to review your child's records. If you want to get copies, you want with your school. When we looked at that one about school processes, every school may have a little different way to access the information, but you have the right to review your child's records. Your child's records, you have a right to privacy. Um, we can't be discussing anything unique about your child out and about. You, you know, it's, your child has civil rights and liberties. You have a right for that IEE, the Individual Education Evaluation. You have a right to um, be involved with any kind of discipline records or reporting. Part of your procedural safeguards also deals with um, mediation, um, due process, and you also have the right to be provided the information in your native language. Discipline is a huge topic on its own in terms of restraint procedures, restraint and seclusion. You need to be familiar with the definition. You need to be notified. If your child is sort of maybe melts down and may be a danger to himself or others, or at least perceived as that, um, if there is going to be restraint or seclusion, you need to be informing you of that as well as monitoring and policies and procedures. There's what we call special policies and procedures, which are so lengthy. But all of this is public information. We have no company secrets. It's just knowing the vocabulary, knowing what to ask for, and knowing that what can be beneficial to you. And if as a parent, because you know your child better than anyone, you know that your child may actually be in this position please feel free to talk to your IEP team so you can create a crisis plan that is so important because if you don't speak about this, probably it is going to happen that they are going to face a crisis and they are not going to be prepared for that. So we need to be prepared. Everyone needs to be prepared. Everyone needs to know what they are going to do and how they are going to address these situations or these behaviors because many times we see on the news really bad things happening at school but it's not because people is mean, it is actually because people, they don't know how to react. They don't have a plan, and this is a real crisis. So think about it and approach your IEP team, let them know what is happening, what happens, how do you work with your child in these cases, because the information that you provide is going to be crucial in order to create a plan. Good point. Okay, steps to conflict resolution. You know, I used to do a workshop early on called, like, Navigating the System. Sometimes in a very large district, Lee County is a very large district, it really is key to kind of know your navigational system. 
your number one person that you should be communicating with is your teacher. Your teacher truly needs to, you need to be on the same page. If you still are not feeling comfortable with something, the principal of your school is ultimately responsible for the day-to-day -day doings that go on in that school. So you need to know teacher, who's your principal, your assistant principal. You just need to know who these people are. Um, there's also district ESC personnel. We just a couple of last month had a, a kickoff with the ESC advisory committee. And the ESC advisory committee is um, made up of parents, educators, district people. But in the district, there's a director of exceptional student education. There's an assistant director of exceptional student education. There are coordinators that are divided based on elementary, middle, or high school. We own all of this navigational charts and would be happy to be able to provide that to you. Um, you need to know the definitions of how to also what your procedural safeguards are and how what steps you can come to to resolve conflicts. When you're in conflict, in any of us when we're in conflict, whether you're in conflict with your spouse, your children, your girlfriend, your, your, neighbor. your neighbor, life is not good, in, in my opinion. I, I'm not a queen of conflict. I kind of like to see what we can do to get along. And they are, there are steps to help resolve things to keep that eye on the prize, which is your child. The IEP team, sometimes you have difficulty coming to a resolution. There are steps and ways of coming to a consensus. Consensus deals with can you live with it? I mean, it doesn't mean anybody walks away with the catalog. It's about coming up with small agreements and building consensus. If you still can't come to consensus, you know that you have the right to mediation, you have the right to file a state complaint. To, with the Department of Education, Office of Civil Rights, or ultimately you can go due process. Um, these are all very intricate pieces. It means that you need to, in my heart, we need to come out wanting to collaborate. If we're unable to do so, you need to know the system that's in place to be able to help you resolve that conflict. And when conflict arises, when we are talking about families and we are talking about our children, it's really hard to not to get emotional. Mm -hmm. So many times it happens that families, they have been trying really hard. They have been calling. They have been going to the school. They have been trying to talk to the teacher. They don't get any response, and they go directly to the due process. They feel like, okay, nothing is working, and they don't follow the steps. So it's very important for you to understand that first you have to learn to communicate in written. It's important that everything that you try to communicate to the teacher, you send an email, you send a letter. This is because many times we talk so much, we have so many informal information or communication that we forget about things. So when you learn that everything goes in written, you have actually proof of the things that you are requesting, you are actually being a professionally informing about your concerns. You have more time to think about the things that you want to talk or you want to request. So it's like a successful process and you have to follow the steps. So if things are not working at the first step, go to the next one, then go to the next one. Be sure that you have documentation all the time. Be sure that you are doing your best to actually create collaboration and come to an agreement because no one wanna go to the final step really and things can get resolved when everyone is working together. You know, one part that's not in this plan, Ileana, but basically what you and I do is when you're invested in this process, you need to, in my mind, you need to support yourself with people who are good for you. So you can call a friend to go with you. You can have an advocate come with you. You can seek out people who are going to support you in your efforts to advocate for your child appropriately. It's about building that team of invested stakeholders, people who can help you, so that we ultimately can help each other. Um, so grow your team with good, healthy people around you so that you are effectively heard and ultimately your child Prospers. Exactly, and you have that emotional support because this is hard job. This is not easy for anyone. 
it takes time, it takes year for actually, you know, understand all this information. It is a lot of information and you are going to become an expert throughout the years actually. The most important that you have to have from the beginning is like unconditional love for your child. You have to believe in your child and keep going because you know that your child can do it and everyone is going to be working with you. Again, as Donna was saying, you know, it's not that people is actually making decisions on your own. You are part of the team and you have to understand that you are part of the team and take that responsibility and work together so things can happen. And the part about it being emotional, I think, is key. I see one of the participants in today is actually a friend of mine, Christine Raptus Wright, and she has so much knowledge about transition and post-school outcomes. Having her as a friend as well as an advocate she was able to speak with me about all of my children at different points in our life. And whether I was crying or I was nervous, she was able to attend different meetings with each of my children and I to kind of take that emotional piece away and be the factual person that helped us move forward in attaining our goals as a family, in attaining our goals for that post-school life outcome. So those are the folks you want in your circle. And I think to end, I'm going to say, as a parent, your biggest responsibility is to remind the team that your child is a child, that is the most important person in your life, because it's not because people is mean or they don't want to do their job, but they have other students, they deal with this all the time. Many times we forget, you know, that we are talking about a person and we already have ideas about what services we can provide based on on, you know, the disability or something like this because we want to help. So it's the parent's responsibility to come to that table and talk about that person as an individual, remind everyone that the price is to actually make that person successful to provide all the services and to remind them that there's an amazing advocate who knows how to collaborate and out of love is going to be everything possible for giving that uh, a student the best choices so he can be or she can be successful at the end. I too want to say thank you so much for tuning in. Stay safe as we make our master our way through our season. And we are interested in your feedback. So if we can provide you with any additional knowledge, supports, or services, we're here for you. Okay, so we're going to open the microphone because we have a question. SM, I just opened your microphone. I just don't know if you have a microphone because it's not available so if you don't have a microphone and you would like to write down your hello. question oh there you go hello how many hello i have a question how many primary exceptionalities can a child have in their iep that's a really good question i really don't think there's a final answer on that i've seen children with one and I've seen children with so, so many. There really isn't a cap or a number. Um, we usually, as a team, try to decide which exceptionality captures the child, but we'll call that their primary exceptionality. <coughs> and then I've seen secondary um, exceptionalities on afterwards. Good question, but the, I don't believe there is a cap. Thank you. Did I answer your question? Okay. Yes, you did. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Do we have any more questions or comments? No. Well, thank you, everyone, for being here today with us. Thank you, Donna, so much. This, this was an amazing beginning. This was our first, <laughs> so thank you for hanging in with us. We look forward to working together in the future. Enjoy your day. So we are going to send you an email next week with a questionnaire so you can let us know if you are interested about uh, coming back to the webinars and learning about some specific topics and we are going to be the next scheduling more webinars for all of us. High five, Eliana. High five. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Have a great day.